Hi, my name's Jeff Watts and welcome to another episode of In Conversation With. Now, this episode I've called Dutch People Are The Most Difficult, said a Dutchman, not me. And in this episode, a good friend of mine, Niels Verdonk, came over to London from Agile 42 in the Netherlands to help co-teach a CSM class with me. Now, at the end of day one, we sat down for a completely unscripted conversation and we started talking about the differences between UK classes and classes in other countries, which led to us talking about the differences in culture within countries and across countries and across companies within countries and ultimately how different cultures align differently to the Agile values and principles. After that, the conversation morphed into how you might be able to apply Scrum in non-software environments, such as jet engine design and build, and creation of bed linen. Anyway, I hope you enjoy In Conversation with Niels Verdonk. The Dutch are the most difficult, said a Dutchman, not me. Hey, you doing, mate? Very good, Jeff. Good. Thanks for doing this. Yeah, so I'm going to squeak a little bit. Okay. Yeah, we need, we need a bit, that's, that's the chair, that's not... Uh, that's not our joints. It feels a bit we finished the day's training. Yeah. <laughs> Rusty. So Niels came over to help me out and cover me and uh, supervise me. And we were both fans of pair training as well. So when we get the opportunity, we try to. And uh, so we've just finished day one. Day one of the CSM in London. How'd you feel it went? Yeah, it's pretty good. It was, uh, it was nice to see um, uh, yeah, a different type of uh, uh, yeah, training format from another trainer, and uh, yeah, it's uh, it's always good to uh, to have some inspiration. And uh, would you say that this, this audience was any different to a typical Dutch audience? So, in this class, typically the, the we we had good representation of both. The ends of the spectrum, right? So quite some, some really experienced guys, yeah. um, like four, five, six years, and uh, also some people that has like what Scrum is an acronym. Uh, I don't know. <laughs> but, um, so so my the, roommate we didn't have it up. Yeah. <laughs> so we, we didn't have a lot, a lot of people in the middle. Right? Yeah. So uh, I'm always a bit of, a bit concerned when I have people that have uh, like four, five years of experience with Scrum because um, they might be. Um, bored easily with the, the, the basic stuff, but mm. we still have to cover the basics. We have to make sure that everybody is, is on the same level yeah. when it comes to the basics of Scrum. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, uh, yeah. So we, we, the experienced guys behaved. They so, did, yeah. and, and you can bring them in, right? So they've got a lot of experience to share as well. So just because we have experience doesn't, doesn't mean that it's the only experience. And that's, that's part of it. So we've got people who've been doing this for a long time, sitting with people who haven't, and yet yeah, they can. When we give them some questions to answer, often a lot of these questions don't have a right answer, so they can explore different perspectives and things themselves. They almost become auxiliary trainers for us, if you like, the, the experienced people. Yeah, so I had a, a conversation at the coffee machine with one of them, um, and uh, yeah, I don't know who was saying it was, but the best way to learn is uh, to teach others. Yeah, so, so yeah, it's an opportunity for them to, to teach and to try to summarize their understanding of Scrum in in, 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 a, in a short, concise message will also help them to, to, to improve their understanding of Scrum. Yeah, and that's something we need to do. Scrum masters need to do, they need to be able to explain to people. I was doing that with one, so my, my daughter's just finished some of her exams, school exams, and uh, she has a sort of revision process, you know, where she goes through her notes and reminds herself, highlights things, then goes through them again and actually sort of writes out the things that she's highlighted because writing it out helps her just remember things. Um, and then she'll say, can I tell you something? So, yeah, tell me something. So she tells me about you know, this, this chemi chemical procedure or whatever, and she just by telling you helps me understand it a little bit more. So you have to you learn things in a different way, don't you, when, you, when you're telling other people. Yeah. So yeah. you have to, uh, to also uh, appreciate what, what level they at and, yeah. and explain it in, in sometimes layman's terms. Yeah. Uh, uh, because, the, yeah. Um, otherwise you might uh, you know, blow them out of their minds. Yeah. I'm interested in the, um, the sort of cultural, if, if there are any cultural differences. So I used to teach, I used to teach in different countries quite a bit, but I don't really do much anymore. Um, and you, you do, don't you? you teach in Germany and Belgium and different places. So do, would you say there's any difference from country to country in terms of 
like class attendees and culture and things? Yeah, I think those people are the most difficult. <laughs> you can say that because you're that. Yes. <laughs> no, so I think um, in, 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 in the Netherlands, um, I think people are quite uh, uh, vocal and, and, and uh, um, uh, yeah, maybe will be asking endless amounts of questions about uh, insignificant things, so you yeah. have to slow them down a little bit. Um, I did a training course in, uh, in, in, in Croatia where um, there were hardly any questions and I was like, okay, this can't be right. So, um, and um, it turned out that um, a lot of the people in the class, were 26 was a large group, um, were sort of men had to, were mandatory going to this, this class. They were okay. signed up by the right start department, right? Okay. So, uh, we're going to do to Agile, you're going to do the product order class, you're going to do the Scrum Master class, so... So um, kind of prisoners in a training. Yeah, so, so, so they're probably not as, as engaged, whereas yeah. if you have a public class like this, uh, people that um, um, individually signed up for this, maybe even paid out of their, their own mm. money, mm. Uh, they're much more um, engaged in the, yeah. in, in the class. Um, yeah, I think, I think it's probably not that... So would you change your facilitation style if you were going to run a class in Germany, for example, if, compared to if you were running one in, in Holland? Yeah, but actually, when I think that's out of Deutschmach in Deutschland, then yeah, then would it be a bit different. Wie kann ich am besten zum Bahnhof bitte? No, so so um, yeah, so a lot of people think you know Germany is a very big place and. Uh, Culture in Germany is also quite uh, widespread. Yeah, um, I'm sometimes teaching in the in the um, area of Düsseldorf, and um, I have a lot of people very vocal, outspoken, um, and sometimes I'm in a bit more traditional area of Germany, um, and. You don't sense a lot of uh, uh, how, the, how the, the class is do, doing. Yeah. Right? So you have to, to add, uh, build in a couple of more feedback loops and, and check the, the temperature of the of the room. Mm -hmm. um, okay, because that's that's something. I mean, we've got a question today, which we get quite often with: how do you how do you deal with sort of geographically distributed teams where you've got a mix of cultures there and adapting your facilitation style to, to encourage participation from different people in different cultures. That's, that's yeah. quite a challenge for people. Right? Yeah. yeah, so the, the, I, I believe that the uh, Eastern European cultures are, um, are quite compatible with Scrum. Okay. Because, uh, um, you know, they don't hold back, uh, they, they are outspoken and they don't, uh, um, yeah, they don't have a problem with stepping on somebody else's toes. And okay. this is, I, I think, good. Um, of uh, yeah, getting the message across and making making things transparent. Mm -hmm. um, I've also had some, some experience with some teams in, in India or uh, or Mexico, China, where uh, people um, are a bit more used to to you know the boss is always right and you don't go against the um, um, the opinion of the boss. Yeah, the, or they're even in the room, right? So um, I, I once had. Uh, a team where I was uh, coaching the, the, the scrum master and I was attending a couple of scrum meetings and I was had a conversation later so, so we didn't hear this person or that person at all and the next time I was trying to draw them out yeah. I, I really ask them a question um, on the person and, 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 and ask them uh, to contribute but they still were very reluctant to, to speak up okay. and um, Sometimes when I ask them a question, somebody else has started to answer. <laughs> um, and then later I figured out, well, that person is the other person's boss. Yeah. So he's not going to, or she's not going to say anything in the presence of their boss. Um, and when you ask the question to the uh, subordinate, well, that's a good term, but um, the boss will answer on their behalf. Mm. Um, and, and that's probably very cultural. Yeah. Um, South Africa also has a, I believe you call it a paternalistic okay. culture, so um, more respect for the senior or seniority in, in organizations. Okay. So, uh, yeah. Is that, because that, that's, that's going to that's gonna hinder an organization's ability to be agile, right? Yeah. Yeah, so it's going to be harder to create that, I think what we 
we would call it these days psychological safety yeah. in an environment where people are you know, can speak freely um, without uh, being afraid of stepping on somebody's toes or uh, um, rubbing somebody the wrong way. Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm a firm believer that all of these behaviours that, that we see are positive in intent. So that, that manager who's answering on behalf of their their employee. They're doing that for a good reason, perhaps to protect them, perhaps mm -hmm. to, uh, I don't know, but that is, how do we then help them understand that actually there's, a, there's another way of doing it that's more helpful? How, yeah. how do we do that? Yeah, well, first of all, I think um, uh, assuming positive intent, I think is probably a very good um, uh, standpoint to start sort of from, from as a coach, mm -hmm. right? um, no judging, and uh, um, it starts with making them aware of in what way that limits them, um, their ability to, to, to be in an agile team. Mm -hmm. And um, it's probably going to be uh, more difficult if it's a uh, very strong value in their culture, either organizational culture or, or um, um, how do you call that, the, the culture of a country. Yeah. Um, and once they actually buy into how that limits their, their ability as an adapt team, maybe they're able to, to overcome it. Mm. And it, it, initially, it's probably going to be um, unnatural for, for them to, to do that. Um, mm. uh, but hopefully, by um, yeah, doing it more often, it becomes more, um, more natural to do yeah. that. And, and they, they, they won't feel awkward uh, sharing. There's a little bit of that um, conscious competence model, isn't it? So to begin with, at the moment, that manager isn't aware of their incompetence. Yeah. It's a harsh word to use, you know, of, but they're not aware of that. And then, as a coach, we can help them become aware of that, hopefully without making them feel defensive or, or, or judged. And if there's something if there's something in it for them, if they can see some value and some benefit in, uh, and there's a possibility if they believe it's possible to change then they can start experimenting with that change. And then to begin with, they will be consciously incompetent because they won't be very good at this new behavior and they'll have to battle through that and repeat it with, with help and support and learn till they become unconsciously competent in the new behavior. But there's a difference between behavior and, and culture. Um, so I've yet to find a culture that hasn't had something or hasn't been able to find something in the Agile values and principles that fits with their culture. Yet I haven't found a culture that doesn't find some aspect of Agile challenging. And so to, to, to adopt that way of working, which if they agree is appropriate and, and valuable to them, they're going to have to look at the bits of it that they do get value from, that do match up with their culture, and, and, and attach to those cultural alignment pieces, while then letting go of the behaviours that undermine those cultural things giving value. Yep. Yeah, so I think my my experience is that um, the cultural differences from countries around the world, I think, are um, probably closer to each other than the cultural differences from some com companies within a certain country. Interesting. So in in Germany, mm -hmm. you might have a very big difference in cultures. I'm working with a startup in Berlin, yeah. you know, developers are coming in at 10.30 and uh, um, uh, working until very late and um, uh, have a very dynamic open culture and uh, um, then you might also have a very traditional um, enterprise type of organization where um, things are much more hierarchical um, um, yeah, more German, German, if you, if you, if you will. So, so that scale, I think, it's mm. it's, it's wider for me um, than just to say, well, uh, the, the culture of Germany is much different than the culture of, of India because I've also worked with um, teams in India that have a very open culture and were able to collaborate quite well and discuss uncomfortable to topics um, quite quite openly. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, I think it's. Uh, um, Culture is something that is related to the, the country, uh, but it's also related to the, the, the company. How long would you say, in your experience, it takes to change the culture of a company? In some cultures, it will take longer than, than others. Mm. 
in an organization where people are used to, uh, yeah, to to hold on to knowledge because it's their job security, it's much harder to create um, a shared learning environment. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, I, I don't think you can put a time on that. Um, I coach an organization where we split a group of two um, or that a large group of developers into two we thought equal groups mm -hmm. with you know a good mix of personalities and skill sets one group was hitting it off had a very nice um, uh, dynamic in the team where it had psychological safety open uh, knowledge sharing and another group was going nowhere and could you have predicted that up front probably not yeah what was the reason? It was also very difficult to pinpoint. Mm -hmm. So, I think, yeah, sometimes chance or luck is also involved. It's not something that we can all uh, predict, but mm -hmm. then we'll have to dig in and prod and figure out, hey, what is what holding that team back? And, yeah. and, and uh, yeah, it's not an easy task. Okay. I mean, it's a rather a fair question, because if I was to ask myself what, well, I'd probably answer something along the lines of, I don't think there's an end state. So if you don't have an end state, then you can't really have a duration. It's, it's kind of a continual evolution uh, based on continual inspection and adaptation. But there is a shift. Um, and that kind of tipping point, if you like, where you have confidence that in any given situation, or in a given situation, anybody within the organization would act in a, in a similar way based on values. I think that that's, that's the kind of thing where you are talking years rather than months. So that was a, a perhaps an unfair question for me to ask. We start the, we started the course today with, do you have any questions that you want us to cover? Um, do you do that regularly? You, you do that kind of thing? Yeah. So uh, usually people sign up, and uh, their maybe their manager is paying for the course, and yeah. uh, then sort of expecting oh, you better come back with an answer to this. And this, and this. Okay. So they, they sometimes come with with a preloaded set of questions. Um, um, so I think it's important to uh, to collect them. So I, I I typically do that also to collect a question list. Um, do you get the same ones every time? Yeah. Yeah. Um, we didn't have one about estimation on, on, on it, which is normally... Oh, so, um, so yeah, the, the, the interest in the retrospective is obviously something that comes up uh, often. Um, well, how to convince senior management of yeah. the course is also one that, that's quite, uh, quite common. I quite, I quite like it when people are coming from a a different context. So today we, we had people who were building airplane engines and we had people who were trying to apply this in non-software, other non-software environments. Um, and I, I, I like that. Like that makes it different to me because I know we're going to get different conversations. I don't, I don't have the answers for them necessarily because I have no idea how to build a jet engine. But uh, I know there's going to be something interesting. Whereas if, if everybody turns up with the same questions, you know, distributed teams, keeping things interesting in retrospectives, uh, convincing senior management, these kinds of the, the, you know, what happens, what, what about project manager and scrum, these kinds of things that happen every time. Mm -hmm. And every now and again you get that. So can you apply scrum to building a jet engine? Okay, cool. You get that kind of thing? You, you, you think what yeah, so uh, I, I actually get uh, uh, a fair amount of people that are not working in a software environment. Uh, I get a lot of questions on email. Hey, I'm uh, thinking of attending your class, but uh, I don't come from software. It yeah. still doesn't make sense for me to, to join. And I usually um, explain to them that uh, you know half my coaching engagements are with non-software companies, and or at least uh, uh, not only software companies, and um, that. Uh, uh, yeah, the people that are getting the, in the classroom um, uh, are not. I'm not saying half the, the people, but uh, quite a large number of people are actually not not work in specific software environments. Okay, what's what's your favorite non-software environment that you've been coaching teams in? Um, well, I, I like um, uh, yeah product development, you know, broad uh, perspective of product development. Yes. Um, uh, I mean, there's in many cases, some software involved, but uh, 
Um, but I'm also doing uh, uh, Scrum coaching for products that have zero lines of code in them, like bed linen, light switches, um, insurance uh, um, projects, uh, marketing teams. So uh, yeah, it's, uh, it's a lot more fun. It's a little bit more challenging. So how can you make bed linen more agile? Well, by by uh, focusing on the the, the value you, del you deliver for the for the customer. Yeah. And 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 so, I, mean, I think I think you can do anything with agile as long as you figure out um, how can we deliver value to the customer iteratively and incrementally um, and 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 validate uh, what we deliver to the to the customer. So in the in the example of the light switches, um, uh, there's a there's a hardware cycle that's quite long because you, you have to make plastic molds and send them off to uh, to, to China and then, then wait until they actually uh, ship the, the the samples via a ship in in five weeks and uh, so that's there's a lot of delay in feedback mm -hmm. and um, uh, so you're gonna have to to challenge yourselves and find. A way to shorten that feedback loops. Um, also in electronics, um, uh, so you can have these uh, um, um, dynamic circuit boards where you can just stick some wires in, in circuit boards and some they call it resistors and, and transistors and blah blah blah. It's going to be have a product with wires sticking out everywhere, but at least you have a, a shorter feedback loop and you don't have to um, do the uh, the design of the circuit board. Completely up front. Yeah. You remember when in the old days of software development, the DBAs always said, "No, no, no! You can only design the, 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 the data model once. You have to do it right the first time." Yeah. And uh, those were usually the most difficult ones to convince of an agile approach. Mm -hmm. um, and you also have those in the in the circuit board design. Right? Yeah. So if you have a way to dynamic your to dynamically uh, design your your circuit boards iteratively, incrementally, emergent. If you will, then um, you obviously are also um, can add a next level of agility to your your project. Mm. Um, because otherwise, yeah, you're only resorting to doing more design up front. Yeah. yeah. So you're a big fan, I me, mean, of of using agile outside of the software world. Yeah. Yeah. Was, you seen it was a while ago, I think, but I remember seeing something on Twitter from Ron Jeffries. Who was getting, seemed to be quite angry about people using Scrum and, and Agile outside of the software world. He said, don't do that because we still haven't sorted the software world yet. That's what it's for. <laughs> do you see that? I didn't see that, that specific tweet, but uh, I know some people that uh, um, are uh, mad about the term Agile being abused in uh, all kinds of uh, different things. And yeah, it sometimes annoys me a little bit as well that uh, you see an article for um, a former project manager that was exposed to Agile in, in, in the last three months and posted something on LinkedIn, his perspective on Agile, and it's just, uh, it's Agile is Spotify, or Agile is, um, is safe, or right? so they, they, they missed the entire um, history of the Agile Manifesto and how it evolved, and, and I, I guess guys like uh, Ron Jeffries and Chad Hendrickson and all those guys are uh, the, the, the old generation that was actually at the, at the, the birthplace of, mm. of Agile. Mm -hmm. And uh, um, a little bit more protective of it. Yeah, it applies, you can easily apply it to uh, any type of um, um, product development. Mm -hmm. And what, what product in the, in the age of Internet of Things is software only? Mm -hmm. No, it's, 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 it's a product. Yeah. So, yeah. So, for example, Alexa. Uh, or uh, um, whatever kind of uh, internet thing connected device, there's a hardware and software parts to it. Yeah. And they should be um, developed hand in hand. Yeah. It's not like, oh, we've finished with the hardware, can you put some software in it, please? Yeah. Uh, that, that's not making sense. No. It's, not, it's not done. The software is not, not done, done, is it? No. no. And you just, <laughs> you just started quite a few people's home assistants off there. You see these people are watching like they make videos and in it they'll say, Hey, Alexa, order me some more wine. <laughs> and because people are watching it near their, their device, <laughs> there's people having their wine ordered for them. <laughs> well, you just uh, ordered that. Yeah, exactly. Have a drink for me. Yeah. <laughs> Thousand boxes of wine, Alexa. Yes, sir.
Sorry. It's alright. That's probably our, our key to get it. Yeah. Was that Thanks right? for chatting, mate. Okay. Good to see you again.